Welcome to Three, a show about Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic. I'm Gil Gross, host of Monday Match Analysis with outstanding tennis journalist Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy. And on today's show, we get into everything Novak in New York. And some of that is hitting tennis balls. Some of that is trying to reach the governor so that Adrian Manorino can play his tennis match and trying to set up a, a players association. It's been a crazy time, but let's start on the court. Amy, any big takeaways um, in terms of Djokovic's tennis right now? Yeah, I watched the match last night against Struff, and I could not get my head around why Novak was doing so well on his serve, especially when I looked at the individual statistics. First serve percentage, 63%. I mean, that's good, but it's not lights out. Just Struff's 58%. Percentage of first serve points, 172%. Okay, now we're, we're getting somewhere. So there's this metric that's been developed, I think, by the ATP called serve efficiency. And you can do it on first serve or second serve. So I looked at Novak's serve efficiency, which is a blending of those two, and you get 53%. That's, <clears throat> excuse me, getting up there toward Karlovic range. And uh, Struff's serve efficiency was only 35%. So 53 to 35, he's dominating this category of being extremely efficient with his serves. So when you, <clears throat> when you dominate that much in one area of the game, it's going to start looking really easy. And I just wonder, you know, what goes up must come down. I'm just wondering, like, how long can he maintain this? Well, it's going to be interesting when he starts to play some better returners and how they threaten him. I mean, Struff, uh, no, no threat whatsoever. Uh, Martina Navratilova would sometimes call these matches batting practice. I mean, that was a pretty routine. Was there ever a time, really, where he was, he was threatened by, by Struff with any significant shots? I, don't, I, I would really say think. not even a smidge. Not even a smidge. So, so it's fascinating when these guys with such good ground strokes as Novak, and I remember people like... Uh, Andre Agassi, Jimmy Connors, get in a lot of first serves and just go to work. I mean, these guys have such good ground strokes, someone like Novak. He's not threatened. He's not being put on the run. The guy's not taking any tactical variations. And, uh, and Novak is just so, so balanced. I mean, we talked about that before, how he just more or less smothers people. He doesn't even have to do it with the, with the brilliance, the obvious brilliance we see from a Federer or Nadal. He just kind of goes to work. Starts hitting it's, a lot about the court. It's yeah. almost like the harder you hit, the easier it makes it look. I mean, it's like he loves that. Uh, I, I have to credit this guy on Twitter, Matt Rackett, um, came up with the perfect analogy. He said it's like when you throw lightning at a Pikachu, and the Pikachu just gobbles it up and throws it right back. I mean, very easy. Doesn't even break a sweat. It's well, so these guys funny. are his contemporary. These guys are the contemporaries, and he's right in that thick groove he's been in it for a long time that's why it's great it's like I, I know I know your deal I mean there's going to need to become need to come another paradigm another level someone new who's new and younger has a whole other upgrade of power and accuracy and maybe variation that topples him and that's that's the way the game works I mean uh, the leading guy poses the problem statement and if it's his contemporaries they've got what they've got it's a little bit the way the, the issues that let's say Roddick and um, Leighton Hewitt face versus Federer. It's like, we've all grown up together. We're around the same age. We've got the same things. So Novak's born, someone, someone younger, someone 10, 15 years younger is going to need to come along and say, all right, old man, I've got something new. I've, have you seen a kick serve like this? Watch this, Novak. Watch me go after you now. I'm going to watch me return your serve, which is pretty good, but the second serve of Novak isn't like stellar. And maybe someone younger is going to be practicing the game of tomorrow that can really kick, kick Novak to the curb. Yeah, the, the Pikachu analogy was, yeah. uh, that was that was about the matchup, the Struff djokovic matchup. And it's like hitting it hard at, at Djokovic, and I think Medvedev is in this camp as well, it's not going to do anything. Djokovic does not mind your pace. You can hit it 90 miles per hour, and he's going to say, okay, I'll just, you know, I'm, I'm happy to redirect this ball and use the pace against you. I almost think... If you're playing Djokovic, Joel, like you're someone on the court, you take pace off the ball all the time, right? Often. Not always. I, not every single time, Gil. Come on. I can't. Oh, yeah. I'm just, 
variation, Joel, variation. But but you're you're willing to probably slow down your racket speed sometimes and you know try to disrupt rhythm and bring your opponent in perhaps. Struff doesn't have that against Novak. He's he's hitting bullets at him. And even in Del against Del Potro in the 2018 U.S. Open final, I I felt like Del Potro was just belting the ball and instead of breaking the sideline, breaking the baseline. And exactly. Novak is like, okay, I'm gonna stand, I'm gonna stand six feet back and I'm gonna counter punch and redirect your pace. It's no problem for Novak if you're hitting it hard at him. And, and Struff, open up the court. I mean, he was, uh, Struff was doing uh, aggressive shots to conservative margins, as Anna Cohn says. That was not a good strategy. I mean, a 100 mile an hour forehand hit with tons and tons of margin right back to the baseline. I mean, Novak's going to take that and start to open up the court. You're so right, but see, so so here's the deal. So the deal is that right now, right, Novak is perfectly comfortable versus the hardest hitters of 2020. Even someone like Del Potro, he's withstood a number of times. So right now, there's a 16-year-old who's studying the contemporary 95-mile-an-hour forehand, hitting it now 89, but maybe by the time he emerges on the tour, he's going to have a 110. And so that's going to be... The, the game changer, just like the way the young Pete Sampras built the kind of game that could take down the Yvonne Lendl. But as, again, as far as his contemporaries go, we haven't seen a lot of questioning. I mean, Dominic Team, you watched how well he pushed Novak in Australia. He huffed and he puffed and even he couldn't quite break him down. He has in Paris. So that's a, a different surface, of course. But uh, yeah, Novak is looking quite, quite formidable. And I think you're right, Gil. I think it's interesting to see if some players have some other tactics that they learned. That's why, that's why the federer Djokovic match up continues to intrigue us because Roger does have slices and he comes in and he volleys. But that's a lot of, you got to have a lot of parts and pieces together. The one thing, I mean, you're kind to refer to my West Coast offense game. The, the trick with that game is you have to have everybody on the field playing. You have to have, you got to have the running backs. You got to have the wide receivers. You got to have all these, all these things. It's like I place a friend who, I said to him, you just, all you need to do is come to net and come to net. I have to have like seven different things going on. And, and again, given this layoff, given this layoff, people have had the people with the more simple game. It's going to be yeah. easier for them. Be yeah, easier people for them. need to diversify their game and to disrupt and, and perfect the transitions within that diversity. That's you can't just hard. volley well and baseline well. You got to get, perfect the blend of the two. But, but given the layoff all these guys have had, the more simpler ones, let's say like people like Novak, people like David Goffin, they're in better shape now because they don't have as many things, they don't have to pose as many questions. They got some pretty good blocking and tackling. So Gil, you would have, you would have fared with your game, you would have fared pretty well after this layoff. I could see it. You get right out there, start going, grinding cross court, just uh, chewing people up. Well, <laughs> the, the not to, being out of shape, you know, is, is not great. But other than that, sure. <laughs> well, let's get, we'll get into maybe um, Novak's draw and who can disrupt him. But first, my, um, my biggest storyline for Djokovic coming into this tournament was all physical because we've all seen Djokovic's top level. I, I think we'd agree that if, if Novak is at his 100% game, it's going to be hard for anyone to beat him. The question is, can he bring that? And after a tough, long match against RBA, and then another three-setter, not quite as physical against Raonic, one day off, then first round of the U.S. Open. I think the big task that Novak had, and it's a difficult one, is he actually needed to physically recover while playing the first week of the U.S. Open. And this match against Struff, 6-3, 6-3, 6-1, under two hours, that's the kind of match that's going to make it happen. That's why I think this match was massive, and I, I do think, at this point, it's fair to be confident that physically, Novak's going to be okay. He's That's looking a good great. point. He's looking great. That, that uh, effort in Cincinnati, New York, as it were, uh, was tremendous. I mean, that RBA semi, he had, a, he had all rights to seem that he was going to lose that match, and he kept on grinding through, and then Raonic started off that final terrific and was playing good tennis, and uh, Novak withstood that. It's like he's almost using, like, tournament matches as practice matches to get himself in shape to win this U.S. Open. Uh, a little uh, 100000 or $165,000 practice match. 
<laughs> we should be so lucky. So who, let's see, in the draw, there is, um, in the quarters, it w- it'll probably be the winner of Gafan and Shapoval. Pablo Carina Busta is uh, next for Djokovic, depending on when you're listening to this podcast. Um, and then in the, in the s- quarter below Novak, it's uh, Zverev. Tsitsipas just got n- knocked out by Chorich. Um, and then we can we can get to to the other half. There's team and there's Medvedev. Who are the biggest threats in the draw, in your opinion, Joel, to to Novak? Oh, no question, it's Medvedev. I think Medvedev by far and away. I mean, I think he has the playing style. He he's so he's so sneaky and he's powerful and he's beaten Novak before as he did in Cincinnati last year. He got to the finals of the U.S. Open a year ago. I think he's head and shoulders the the preeminent contender other ones it's just i mean the shapovalov gafan round the 16 match is intriguing but again the fresh freshness factor dennis had a long five setter with taylor fritz on friday is he going to be okay? and gofan is going to make him hit a lot of balls then gofan to play novak that's a very comfortable match for novak even though there'll be a lot of fine rallies i think it's like oh yeah you're a nice six cylinder car i'm an eight cylinder car <laughs> but again i think uh I think Medvedev, had, Medvedev is kind of the real interesting one. He's been playing pretty well here. And uh, I'll see, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts? Amy, what do you think makes uh, Medvedev so effective? Um, just the um, <laughs> inability to give up ever in a point and the, um, you know, sort of the villain nature of his personality, I think, um, there's oh, an worked, element. He, over. he became a favorite by the end of the tournament. He, he, it took, he, did, he did in 10 days what some people take 10 years to accomplish. He's a rascal. He's a total rascal. Um, but he won't have that crowd. You know, he was saying last year that thank you, thanking the crowd for, you know, firing him up. Um, but I agree with you 100%. And that would be a great match to see Djokovic and Medvedev. What do you think, Gil? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm there as well. That's my final prediction from the start was Djokovic, Medvedev. And uh, I mean, backhand to backhand, Medvedev, there's a handful of guys who can, there's a handful of righties who can hit backhands with Novak. Medvedev is, is in there. There's a handful of guys who can be as consistent and put as many balls in play as Novak. Medvedev is in there. Court coverage, Medvedev is great. He's not to Novak's level, but the serve um, Medvedev can pump it up to a level that Novak actually can't. Um, so st- stylistically, there's a bit of a mirror factor there, and they're doing the same kind of things. And it winds up being very, very physical. The X factor to me in that matchup is the forehand, because Novak's is a lot more solid than Daniil's, and that's, I think, what puts him over the edge. But I totally agree with you that Medvedev is is his biggest threat. I agree with both. Well, there's going to be, if, if that match comes, and it's a little ways away, obviously, there, there's that. Technically, Novak forehand better, but Medvedev has this kind of tactical guile that's kind of intriguing. I mean, yeah. even things like how he, it's not just the serve, it's not just the serve strength, but the serve deployment. I mean, you recall the match when they played, he's, oh, I'll hit my second, I'll hit my first serve as my second serve. I'll, all pop. There's a certain kind of, um, yeah, like you said, he's a rascal. He's not just a rascal how he interacts. There's a certain tactical rascal quality mm. to Medvedev. You know, he'll sneak in, he'll hit drop shots. You know, Novak, you know, when, you're, when you're winning that often, you don't need to adjust. You just trot out your weapons and all this. And then, and then there's kind of the, the experience factor. I mean, Medvedev last year was, had a really good summer, but I don't think any of us expect him to reach the finals of the U.S. Open last year. Now he's defending that, and how does that play out for him as things are? Whereas Novak, this is just like, oh, yeah, here we are. I know this. I know this many, many times. But you bring up a good point, Gil. If I'm scouting for Novak against Medvedev, I say hammer the forehand. Just forehand, 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 forehand. And then if, if he's still in the rally and you see the opening, go backhand to finish. Right. And a surface like this, the, the Daniil, Daniil's backhand is an absolute nightmare because there's, there's no topspin. You can actually read the Wilson U.S. Open label on the ball when he hits his backhand. <laughs> so the ball doesn't bounce at all. It just skids right through the court. Try attacking that. Um, it's, it's, it's quite the shot. 
It'll Are we ready to the greatest hours if they play at least five of the most compelling hours of tennis we ever see because these guys are just gonna settle on in and then if and then and then I think what what I'm intrigued if if that match happens again and we're trying not to look too far ahead the x factor of the moment for Medvedev I mean again last year was all the surprise he's just kept surprising people and surprising people now a little more about expectation and how he truly competes under that kind of pressure and it, we talk a lot about the whole going from being the the hunter to the hunted and how that all goes and for example does does Medvedev have a very draining quarter semi? And that's the thing we wonder about all these players. They're all, they've gone from being under seasons to now they're getting seasons, but are they going to be overcooked because they just haven't played as much? And so what's yeah. going to be the and, and, and the, and the weather? Look, we've seen in New York just the first few days, we've seen rain, we've seen humidity, we've seen temperate uh, conditions. What's it going to be like that second week? Which one of these guys, remember in, uh, I believe it was 2016, Novak had an oven-like semi versus Kyle Monfils. And you know that hurt him uh, versus Stan in the, se- in the finals. Yeah, 2014 against Nishikoria, really, really hot day that, that Kay handled better as well in the semifinals. The first thing you said about Medvedev, that's a, a really important point in my opinion, because the scouting report is also out on the Russian. And everyone on tour now knows you need to slice the ball, shorten the court to his backhand, and you need to go to the net because his passing shots aren't great because he hits the ball so flat. These are the things that I don't think people, I don't think the secret was out um, last summer. No. So, right. So, but so, okay. So, so Novak, yeah, he likes that slice once in a while. He doesn't really care to do that that much. Right. And, he, and, he, and, and the net for him, it's, 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 it's almost cute to watch how Novak has become proficient to the net. It's so studied. And I, and I, admire it i mean you can so you could so see his diligence when he works with coming to that as he did on a key break point in the fifth set of the australian open final and he came to net against team but it's just it's it'll be interesting to see how he variation stubbornness what do you do and again he's novak he's won he's won all these majors what's how does he adjust to these situations people might say why are we not talking about team uh, because he takes a huge backswing, and this is not the right surface for him. I mean, yeah, I think we'll be talking about him in a few weeks. You think, well, yeah, I mean, in a way, it's kind of funny. Uh, people like Medvedev made such an impressive run in that final last year, and team has gotten to three finals now. And I, that, yeah, great point, Amy, about his, his take backs, but he's, he's fit. I mean, It'd be fascinating to learn what all these people did in these five months, what really defined their training routine, whether it's practice sets or running or weights or any of that stuff. And you know, though, team is fit. This we know. So that's going to be intriguing. And we'll see how, how the tournament keeps shaking out for him. And I do like his mentality. Um, I mean, prove me wrong, Dami. I mean, get out there and grab a major. Prove me wrong. Yeah, but you know, remember this. He beat Nadal at the Australian Open. He at the U.S. Open. He uh, two years ago he extended Nadal to a fifth set tiebreaker. So it's not like he's it's not like he's some uh, you know nothing on hard courts. But uh, we'll see. In best of three, he beat Novak at the O2 Arena, the quick indoor hard court. He was uh, absolutely redlining in that match. I don't think it was like a realistic level, but uh, he he did do that. And uh, I think Beat that the re- Federer at Indian Wells, that's a slower court. That's very but, slow. That's like yeah. play. That's like play. <laughs> well, I, I don't think his level um, in the early rounds, I think it's noticeably below what Daniil Medvedev has, has brought to the court. That can change. Yeah. We've seen that happen before where the player who just looks eh, in, the, in the beginning will, will turn it up. But I think early on, Medvedev is just looking to be at a higher level than team. And after the first round loss to uh, Krajinovic last week, I just think right now um, there's just not a lot of momentum behind Dominic Team. It's a funny thing behind between Team and Medvedev. Medvedev is kind of like the it boy. He reached one slam final, and but it was the U.S. Open final, and his playing style was so arresting, and there's so much emotion that he's still kind of like a, a, a an interesting rising stock. Team has reached three slam finals, but in a way that leads us to think sometimes it would lead me to well i don't know 
maybe it's he kind of like netflix you know why is the stock price so high <laughs> whereas you know some of these other big blue chip companies are yeah it's like where's the value there um so are you binging yeah. on that is that what you're saying are people binging we all are we all are um but let's let's give team his due respect there um and and one thing i really like that dominic is doing is changing up his return positions based on what's happening as live in the match. Uh, I don't see a lot of that from other players. So he's trying hard in all aspects of the game. He could break through. Who knows? I, I've mostly seen him on the back fence in New York. And that's fine. And by the way, that's fine. Oh, yeah, think, totally fine. Why not? I mean, yeah, I think, I, look, he's winning matches. He's winning matches. He knows, you know, he, knows, he knows a lot of what he's doing. He's a, I think he's a tremendous but I'll tell you one thing about Dominic Team. He's like the anti-merit Safin. He'll never regret anything. He'll never leave anything on the table. I mean, he'll let every drop. That car's going to come in on empty. Yeah, there are a lot. I, I'm I'm just going to generalize. I think that there are a lot of people who critique Team's uh, return position, and it it drives me kind of crazy because it's. <laughs> It's he has the power to be offensive from, you know, at way behind the baseline where most players can't be offensive. That's just his weight of ball, his strength, and he doesn't have good stroke mechanics to keep it short and return serve. Amy, you were mentioning his his take back. So if he can move back and take a fuller swing at the ball, he's not being defensive just because he's he's 10 to 15 feet back. Well, I mean, Rafa does the same thing. Do people give him that criticism? They do, right? <laughs> they well, because Rafa is, um, after he makes that return from way back there, in about two seconds, he's inside the court. I mean, somehow he does it. Um, I, I'd have to really study Dominic's game a little bit more um, to understand what he's doing after he returns the ball. But as Joel said, it's working for him right now. So we talk about return to serve and Dominic team and Nadal standing way far back behind the baseline. This involves a little bit of a paradigm shift for recreational players who are older. A, a while ago, Gil, I was razzing you about your return position because you're, <laughs> you're of a younger era that plays that sometimes takes your court position that way. And I totally get it for people who are, have such technique. And, and it's, it's not just so much even about power. It's more about racket head speed and margin. I mean, I think you know, because you do this, you're not necessarily standing that far back to hit the ball hard as much as you're looking to hit it really deep. And you have the swing shape that allows you to really use your body and generate that type of arc and top spin and depth and then create the point that way. And again, it's, it's based on an era where you're, you've got about a 99% certainty that your opponent is not serving and volleying. So you're doing mm -hmm. that. You have zero desire to take the return and come to net. So I think it's interesting. I talked to, I talked, well, not from there. If you, if you can, if you can hit a return <laughs> from eight feet behind the baseline to come to net, you are quite the mover. But I think, I think rec, our, our audience who wants to learn how to play better. And we're taught, we talk about learning from these guys. You have to understand how, how the game evolves. I'm not saying it's necessarily better, worse, either it's just ways the techniques evolve and i think one reason people so love roger Federer is because he kind of embraces it all and the older you are the more oh yes Federer. he reminds me of how i was taught you know because as you know i was i was like i like i joked if i stood that far back my return might bounce before it hit the net i'm partially joking but if you said to me stand six feet behind the baseline and hit the ball within two feet of the other baseline i would be taking my technique where it's rarely gone before when it comes to torquing. So again, I just think, I just think the audience needs to understand this and not just think that these guys are standing back there and moonballing and playing defense. There is a distinct purpose. And you, you know this too, Gil, because I know from seeing you play and, and how people like that play, there's definitely offense, defense. It's just called point creation. You know, and again, I, I, one of the first people I saw do this struck me was, uh, was Tommy Robredo. He had that big one-handed backhand take back a little bit like team. And I saw him standing way far back and he was returning a kick serve. And I thought, well, why not? If the guy is, if you know the guy is not serving volleying, 
and let the ball drop and come down and just have faith in your full swing. But again, um, I wasn't taught as much that I didn't learn as much. I learned to play on fast hard courts and our swings were a lot more compact. So we're not, it would be like, imagine John McEnroe standing 20 feet behind the base, 10 feet behind the baseline and returning. He would feel the same thing. He'd, he'd adjust because he's great. But again, I just, I just, this is kind of on in defense of Dominic Team and Rafael Nadal and Gil Gross for returns. Yes. And it really is about technique, isn't it? Because I, I want to take a full swing at the ball. I do not want to have to block it. I do not want to have to keep my, my swing short. I, I, I know how to do it if I have to, but I'm just less comfortable. That's um, your idea of a full, I, we all want to take a full swing. I want to take a full swing too, but my full swing is a lot shorter than your full swing. Right. How I learned. So, in a way, so it's not, you'll see me and you think, you, you think I'm just, I'm, you know, from, I'm just kind of tapping it. But again, it's all how you kind of learn and your sense of movement and court space. And this gets into things about where the volley fits in. So there's a lot of, a lot of things going on here, but I just want the viewers to understand how the game evolves and, and how it shifts. And again, someone might come along Rayo Pelka, that guy should be hitting kick serves so often. And began to that and then hit an angle volley. You know what I mean? Now it's different. So now it, now it adds a different thing. But it doesn't happen that much these days. Well, I think it's situational. Um, you have to know who you're ser who's serving to you and have to be able to adjust. And that's one thing that the big three do so well. Um, Rafa's not going to have the same return position on grass that he is on clay. And, you know, he does both well. He can do anything. We can't. We are, I want to have this grip. I want to take my big swing. I don't feel comfortable doing that. Well, they do. Oh, but I'm never going to stand. I'm never, I'm never going to, I'm more interested in making my in close returns better than standing back far. I mean, it's like there's- What a, if you faced an opponent that had an amazing kick serve that the only way you could handle it was to let it come down. And in that match, you Joel had would just to move stand further back. up. Feels right. That's right. That's absolutely right. That's exactly right. That's how I was taught to deal with a kick serve. That's right. I was taught the way you played a kick serve is you moved forward. It was a, it's a movement shot. It's not a but waiting. What shot. if what if the the it was a you know kick serve that you actually could not. It wasn't working for you. You couldn't handle it to move for forward and take it on the rise. You had to experiment in well, the match with moving back. After I missed the first ten. I'd experiment yeah. with moving back 10, 10. And I was, but again, so, so and, and what this gets at is what I call um, arsenal development. And so in a way, we talked about the young player who's learning how to hit the ball faster than Novak, but also, also the, the smart thing is, hey, wait a second, I, I can solve this problem with a better kick serve. That's, that might be an interesting thing because then, then it has to do with court position. And so there's a young player, there aren't, there aren't that many, even in the program, there aren't that many lethal kick serves. You know, team isn't standing there to defuse a kick serve. He's just standing there to get the point going on, his, on the way he wants to. So, so it's an interesting thing. So maybe out there, there's someone who's saying, hey, wait a second. These guys like team and Nadal, they're standing further back. I need to learn a really good kick serve. I mean, the way the 14-year-old the now who wants to take over from Novak might be learning that kind of kick serve and an angle volley. Maybe that's what's going to take down the Novak five years from now. Well, this was a really fun discussion. Of course, it, it had nothing to do with what we planned on talking about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, well, Novak Djokovic safely into the second week of the U.S. Open. We'll be watching him carefully, maybe an emergency podcast if something crazy happens. Uh, but we're very much looking forward to following his run in New York. Make sure you leave a comment. Like the video, subscribe on YouTube. We're also available on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. That is always very much appreciated. And we will see you next time on the next episode of 3.